All right, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, hopefully we are back in business. Can I get, uh, yep, looks like we're back. Okay, sorry for the interruption. I'm going to uh, at least remove the camera and hopefully that uses a little less bandwidth here and we don't experience the same interruptions. Can folks hear me? Huzzah! All right, so we were talking about all of the exciting ways that uh, pathogens can mess with our bodies. One of those ways is by simply overgrowing and putting pressure on specific membranes or cavities. If you've ever had an ear infection, you know exactly what that feels like. Um, they can produce toxins. Um, toxins that destroy our cells. They can also parasitize. Parasitize cells and destroy their normal structure and function. Um, so the example that they give us here is fungal infections. Uh, for example, athlete's foot. These are parasitic fungal infections. Um, and not to gross anyone out, but if you've ever seen, we'll do this in orange, if you've ever seen ringworm, it starts off as a very localized infection. And it's not actually a worm, but what people were describing was the shape of the rash that forms in rings as the fungus literally eats its way out from the center uh, on the patient's skin. So what are some general defense mechanisms that the body uses to help prevent colonization by pathogens? Uh, for example, what general defense mechanisms are involved in local inflammatory responses? So this is getting to what some of your questions were uh, earlier, I think. With neutropenic fever, the fever is the body's response to the lack of neutrophils? Uh, I don't know. Neutropenia is the presence of abnormally few neutrophils in the blood, leading to increased susceptibility to infection. Yeah. Right on. So general defense mechanisms. Let's go from the outside in. The skin. Mucous membranes. Act as physical barriers two pathogens. Um, we also have uh, glandular secretions, excuse me, um, that include lysosomes and keep the skin at an acidic pH, somewhere between three and five. Remember last week we were saying human pH is closer to seven something, <laughs> excuse me, uh, which will inhibit the growth of many microbes. Excuse me, just one moment, folks. And we're back. Okay. Glandular secretions include lysozymes. Did I say lysosomes? Lysozymes. Keeping skin at acidic pH, to 
inhibit the growth of many microbes. So let's talk localized injury. Um, we were talking about you know, local inflammatory response. A localized injury might release prostaglandins and histamines, and these cause the increased blood flow and swelling in the area. So this could be related to the increase in temperature. It's also going to be that, that inflammatory response that y'all were describing earlier. So a localized injury uh, releases prostaglandins and histamines, which increase blood flow and swelling. Um, the clotting mechanism uh, helps prevent invasion by additional pathogens. Clotting, again, was um, carried out by platelets that we were talking about in the bone marrow, bone marrow cells, the stem cells. Clotting mechanisms help prevent invasion by additional pathogens. Also, secondarily, the loss of blood, <laughs> uh, which we need to carry oxygen around. We also have uh, phagocytic white blood cells. So the prefix phago uh, or phago, meaning to eat, to devour, um, Phagocytic white blood cells literally devour, <laughs> um, consume pathogens. So again, not to gross anybody out, but the pus that forms at the site of an infection is an accumulation of those phagocytic cells. If you want more detailed descriptions of these, again, I'm going to throw this in here. Um, chapter 43. Pus, not puss in boots. Absolutely not. All right. In specific immunity, how do B cell responses differ from T cell responses? And Tempting the live stream gods that be. Uh, let's go ahead and get some suggestions in the chat. How do B cells respond versus T cells in specific immunity response to a specific antigen? Has the live stream frozen again, or are we just thinking? Awesome. B cells produce antibodies. T cells, like cytotoxic T cells, can kill infected cells. Yep. B cells produce antibodies and destroy viruses. T cells directly fight pathogens and produce cytokines. I like it. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. Individual B cells. Um, these are going to respond to specific types of foreign antigens by secreting antibodies that interact with the antigen and cause the cells to um, agglutinate or clump together is one way that they fight infection.
Lots of good answers in here, folks. So the, the, the clumping together, this agglutination, is actually really important because it it's flagging um, it tags or identifies the antigens for removal by other cells. So like by phagocytic macrophages. Um, and other antibodies can interfere with the, the function of antigens uh, by binding with them and blocking their actions. So let's, let's write a little bit more here. Uh, the clumping together tags the antigens for removal by other cells. antibodies can interfere with the function of the antigens by binding with them and blocking their actions. We had some good uh, responses for T cells and this is where we should probably spend more of our time. So when, when the body's cells become infected with a pathogen, a piece of the foreign protein from the pathogen will interact with a major histocompatibility complex molecule. Um, and, and cell infection can happen through a couple of mechanisms. But before I get too far ahead, let's, let's go ahead and write that down. When body cells become infected with a pathogen, a piece of foreign protein, come on now, from the pathogen interacts with a major histocompatibility complex molecule. Cells can be infected um, by phagocytosis, so the, the pathogen engulfs the cell, or by endocytosis, by, by getting inside the cell. Um, and it might, it might even lice, cause it to burst. Um, can occur by phagocytosis or endo. Psychosis. Um, the MHC antigen complex migrates to the surface of the cell's membrane. The individual T cells bearing complementary antigen receptors on their membrane surfaces interact or bind with the antigen displayed on that histocompatibility complex. So, so that combination MHC antigen complex migrates to the surface of the cell's membrane where individual T cells bearing a complementary or corresponding antigen receptors on their membrane interact or bind with the antigen displayed on the MHC of the infected cell. Then our cytotoxic or our killer T cells bind to the foreign proteins displayed on those class one MHC molecules and uh, destroy it in short. Cytotoxic. back up. I forgot a piece here. Um, oh, and we've got another piece here. So the, the helper T cells, the help, helper T cells bind to antigens displayed on class two MHC molecules, and then the cytotoxic T cells act directly by killing the infected cell. That was a mouthful. How are we doing, folks?
So after we've killed the infected cell, the immune response has done its job. It wants to remember how to do that job, and so it propagates. Uh, it divides and produces clones of the activated helper T cells and memory helper T cells for future responses. The activated helper T cells produce cytokines, which help the appropriate B cells to differentiate into antibody producing into antibody producing cells. They also help cytotoxic T cells to become active in killing the infected cells. So it's 4.57. We have two questions left. I'm happy to stick around and wrap these up. Y'all are not obligated to stay, but your presence is welcome. Um, as always, please upload your worksheets to the drop-in folder with your name and email uh, by the deadline for graded completion. Everything's just graded on completion uh, for that sweet extra credit. And as always, feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions. So moving on. If about 10 to the fifth genes are available in the human genome to produce proteins, how can we produce more than 10 times 10 to the sixth different kinds of AB receptor proteins on B cells? So 10 to the fifth genes are available, but we can do more than 10 times 10 to the six different kinds of receptor proteins on B cells. Think back to last term and the way that DNA code, which is made up of only four different, those letters, right, A, T, G, T, result in all of the different proteins amino acids and then proteins that express life as we know it, right? I'm seeing now that I had some uh, requests to scroll up and I am afraid I didn't see them. I'm sorry about that. Right, so, so in a similar way that different codons manifest different amino acids, which in different combinations make different proteins, um, we have a similar effect here. So the information that the immune system can produce more types of B cells than there are genes in the genome uh, begs this question. Um, let me scroll back down here. I mean, each of the variable regions of the antibody on both light and heavy chains is made, of, um, made up of three different parts. And each is coded by a different region on the DNA. So the DNA segments for the three separate parts of each variable region undergo random recombination in the production of B cells. And as a result, many fewer genes are required to code for the 10 times 10 to the sixth different kinds uh, of AB receptor proteins on the cells, on B cells. That was a lot of talking. Let's do some writing. Each variable region on the antibody is made of three parts. Each is coded by a different region on the DNA. The DNA segments themselves for the three separate parts of each variable undergo random recombination in the production of B cells. And as a result, many fewer genes are required to code for the 10 times 10 to the sixth 
different kinds of AB receptors on B cells. So I'm trying to remember exactly how Mm, we'll come back to that. So the last question, how does HIV, that's human immunodeficiency virus, affect the immune system? Is there anyone here under, uh, let's see. I was going to ask how old some of y'all might be, uh, and I'm, I'm curious to know how younger folks are learning about and becoming aware of HIV AIDS because me being over 30 my experience of learning about AIDS was you know the the sheer terror of this thing that we didn't fully understand I was I was really young when uh, the AIDS crisis was really at its peak um, and now we understand a whole lot about it right we know about the AIDS crisis um, so what we understand about it now is it's really a testament I think to the power and progress of medical science because it is not the death sentence that it once was right uh, you you can you can you can have a long full otherwise healthy life with an HIV infection uh, which was not necessarily true when I was young So how does HIV affect the immune system? HIV targets cells that display both the CD4 receptor and a chemokine receptor. So the CD4 receptor we talked about a little bit at the beginning of the broadcast, and the chemokine receptor, so chemical, chemical receptor. These two receptors are found on helper T cells. An infection by HIV ultimately leads to the death of helper T cells. And as a result, destroys immune responses triggered by helper T cells. So infected individuals cannot fight off infections and they may die. So it's not the HIV that typically kills people. It's the weakened immune system and they die of a secondary infection. So HIV target cells that display both the CD4 receptor and chemokine receptor. And these two receptors are found on helper T cells. Infection by HIV ultimately leads to the death of helper T cells. And as a result, destroys immune responses triggered by helper T cells. Infected individuals cannot fight off infections and may die. And so again, I'm curious about younger people's experience around this because it's not as dire as it once was. Um, Antiretroviral anti treatments and others are far more available than they've ever been, uh, which is just pretty darn cool to me. With that, thank you all for your time and attention. Have a great Wednesday. Um, I hope the sun is doing for y'all what it's doing for my mental health. Um, get outside. Have a nice evening. Cheers, guys.